Hello and welcome to the Pinstripe Post trade deadline special with the one and only Joel Sherman, who is a busy man today to say the least, but he made some time for us to break down the Yankees trade deadline moves that they did and didn't make, obviously. But let's start off with welcoming in Joel. How you doing, man? Yeah, good. I'm sitting in Ron Darling's office at MLB Network. I just got done with uh, about seven straight hours of television, just wrote a column for the New York Post. But Ryan, you're on my freaking dance card and we're going to dance. Listen, I'm just happy to get a chance to dance with you here and, uh, as always, talk about what happened here at the Yankees trade deadline. So, Joel, we've been talking about it all year, this team, uh, the way they performed the first two months and then the last month and a half, the way it's gone, it's been a Jekyll and Hyde situation for this team. And we knew that there needed to be moves to be made. There were holes to be addressed with this roster. So just starting off with your initial thoughts, what are you thinking about what the Yankees were able to make in, in moves for this team and helping improve what they what they're trying to do. My initial thought is a big picture league wide one, which is I feel like a lot of Yankee fans will say, where is the star power in this trade deadline? And I would say, where is the star power in this trade deadline for 30 yeah. teams? We didn't uh all 30 teams didn't get Vlad Guerrero Jr. All 30 teams didn't get Yandy Diaz. All 30 teams didn't get Blake Snell, Tarek Skubal, you know, etc. cetera. So uh, Garrett Crochet. This was a supplementary, complementary trade deadline. And if I were thinking about it for the Yankees, the term that keeps coming to mind is they shot Paul. What did they have to do? They had to find at least one more bat that they feel could help the team. And... Under the best circumstances, Jack Chisholm has a lot of qualities that the Yankees could use. Not least among them is he's an explosive player. And as we know, they don't create a lot of runs on the base path. There are all these extra uh, problematic situations. If you look at like the Yankees, how many stolen bases they allow compared to how many stolen bases they have. How many double plays they hit into compared to how many double plays they turn. Well, those are 90 feet that aren't going away and they have kind of a way of winning, which is can their two great players get the ball over the fence a lot. And some of the complimentary players uh, chime in when some of those complimentary players chime in, like has happened over most of the last week, their offense looks very good when they don't, their offense is a two man show. And is it enough? So um, I think jazz chess Chisholm could help if the bright lights in the big city kind of get his full attention his reputation in Miami was as a very ta uh, talented player, but one whose performance and uh, attention could drift. Uh, does this galvanize him? He's playing with a veteran crew. There'll be a full crowd, especially at home every day, which he didn't have in Miami. Does this focus him? We'll see. Uh, it's an interesting question because he is talented and has talents the Yankees need. The other thing that was par at this deadline is they had to get some strikeout performance out of their bullpen. Mark Leiter Jr. strikes out about 33%, and uh, Aniel De Los Santos strikes out about 28%. The Yankees as a bullpen were at, are at about 23%, which I believe going into today was uh, 18th or 19th in the major leagues. So they needed to get some swing and miss. And so that was par in what felt like a very complimentary marketplace all around. They kind of did what everyone else, and now we'll see, did their front office do well? Better complimentary than anyone else. I hate to ramble, but I would say that one of the most important things that happened for them in the small picture, for sure, which is the division, is Baltimore had the same kind of deadline. Like, I, like, Zach Eflin's a good pitcher. If he shows up to start in a playoff series, I don't think everyone's going to be quaking in their boots. Trevor Rogers is a project, the kind of guy, maybe a great analytical organization like Baltimore could fix, but that's hot, hard to do right. mid pennant race with the last two months. We'll see if they can do that because he's talented, but he is far from finished product. They added two relievers that the Phillies, who have the best record in the National League, couldn't wait to get off their roster so they could trade for two other relief pitchers. And Eloy Jimenez was a straight-out salary dump by the White Sox. So is the best thing that happened to the Yankees today that nothing great happened with the Orioles? And really, across the sport, maybe. That's how it kind of feels a little bit to me. And now this is a battle of which front office 
offices did the best at adding around the edges. Yeah, that's kind of what the vibe and the feel of this trade deadline, to your point about what was added and what where the moves were, were going. I guess I want to start with that Jazz Chisholm move because that's what came on Saturday, right, initially for this Yankees team. And, you know, we had spoken last week, and Tommy had brought up the name Jazz Chisholm to you, and you said, not even for free, not even for free. And now all of a sudden we see Jazz on the Yankees team. You saw the impact. As we're speaking right now, they're playing the Phillies right now. Uh, and he had two home runs last night. You know, he's playing third base, a position he hasn't played yet in the majors. So the Yankees are using that versatility, right? He could play second. He could play third, it looks like, in the first initial looks at it. And he could play outfield for them. Ultimately, for this move, is this just a matter of you're waiting and seeing before you make a judgment? Or are you impressed with, you know what, the Yankees got a, a pretty decent player, you know, one that's versatile, one that could play multiple positions and brings energy and speed and athleticism to this team that desperately needed it on its lineup. Yeah. You know, what I do is I always am trying, you know, I, I'm in the business of watching the games and I draw opinion from afar and by asking people, I respect what they think and what they're seeing and hearing. Once a guy gets to New York with either the Mets or the Yankees, I try to be as open-minded as possible. There are players who I thought very little of who came here and I ended up saying better guy, better player than I thought. And there are players who have played for the Mets and Yankees who, when they came here, I thought, wow, what a good addition. And I was underwhelmed by them in every way you could be underwhelmed. I'm thinking, I won't say the name is like the Mets made a trade one year when they were good. And I thought they got absolutely a guy who was perfect for them. And then I, that guy was around and I was like, oh, this guy's really a selfish player and not good for a kind of team vibe. And you only learn that when you're kind of around mm -hmm. all the time. So the book's open for me on Jazz Chisholm and I'll just go back. On a piece of graph paper, and I think this is how the Yankees generally do business, on a piece of graph paper, Jazz Chisholm looks great. And in short burst, if you're there with the Marlins, he looks great. But go talk to people with the Marlins who had have, have to live with it for 162 games. And that's why I'm wondering, can it drift because there's 4,000 people in the crowd? Can it drift because there's not strong veteran leadership? Could it drift because there's not a media that will hold you to a larger accountability right. than in other places? He is a talented player talented enough that his performance should actually be better than it has been to date. I'll say this. You know who I just described? Paul O'Neill. Paul O'Neill was, was less than the sum of his parts, came to New York to a place where he kind of like was awed by Don Mattingly. Uh, and like, it was perfect for him. And he rose to a well above average player, way beyond complimentary. Is that in Jazz Chisholm? Maybe. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Um, there were, they needed to add. And is Isak Paredes better? I don't know. Uh, who's the third best position player that got traded? I, don't, I mean... I mean, Yandy Diaz didn't go. Yandy I thought Diaz. it would have been a good ad for them because I think Yandy Diaz can really hit good pitching. And when you're playing a, another of these, at least what they claim, championship or bust seasons, I always think you want guys who can hit good pitching because that's what you're going to get in the biggest games. He didn't get moved. Like, all, three, all the other 29 teams didn't get him from Tampa Bay. And neither did the Yankees. So, obviously, there was a high price on him and it didn't happen. There were, not, you know, nobody wanted Cody Bellinger. Uh, and so I'm like thinking who moved of significance? Chisholm and Paredes, are those the two best? Yeah, I mean, Lane Thomas, you really wouldn't yeah. say. Uh, Tommy Edmond, uh, you know, Dylan. Well, the Cole, Yankees Lajun tried for The Yankees actually right. wanted Tommy Edmond. Uh, but I, I just think it's the big picture, Ryan, which is, this was not a marketplace where you were like, wow, Manny Machado was traded. You know, that kind of thing. And by the way, the year Manny Machado got traded, he was underwhelming to the Dodgers. Uh, you know, again, the Dodgers only knew that once he was a Dodger. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, 
I think he is I I will really do want to watch him play. Right. Because on a team that's built without a lot of with not a lot of exciting players besides when Soto and Judge are swinging. Uh Chisholm has a live body and now I'm curious what it looks like here. And ultimately for you when you're looking at where they slot him, could you see him being the everyday third baseman? I mean DJ LeMahieu wasn't starting any of those three games in Boston. He didn't start last night. You know, he's not starting again tonight. It seems like maybe he's been slid, slid down on that bench. You know, we saw J.D. Davis and Jemai Jones finally get DFA'd. So for Chisholm, could that be a position where it's like, hey, man, there's an opening here because we gave D.J. LeMayu all the opportunity here to earn that third base spot. And if Jazz Chisholm can earn it, do you think that that's a position you could see him slotted in every single day at third base? I think that's where he's going to play a large majority of the games unless any of the following happens. Judge gets hurt, and they decide they'd rather have him out in the outfield uh, or another outfielder gets hurt, and they want him out in the outfield more. But even then, I, I think they just bring Dominguez up and keep him probably at third base. Uh, or, look, we should get into this more as we do the show, but I, who the hell is Glaber Torres? Uh, this year, uh, you know, it fits into my can't play for me team. Uh, you know, even in the good times, the last few days, the attention drifts away. And at some point, you know, you just can't have everyone on the bench. LeMayu's on the bench now, but does Chisholm move to second base because the Yankees just decide, hey, man, we, we can't have you just not playing well on defense on every game. But I would suspect they hope Glaber's bat, which has been much better for about a month now, uh, continues and Chisholm could handle third base. But, you know, learning third base on the go, as athletic as he is, there's some challenge there. I'm curious what it looks like. You know, this is one of those ones I'd rather not start doing report cards after every game. I'd rather, like, get a month and then say, let's let's see what it looks like in every way. That's that's understandable. I, I can I can see why you'd want to see how Jazz. I mean, it's impressive. I know I, I was watching the game last night, and he first play, first chopper. It's a tough bouncer. He made a great play on it. Almost turns a double play if Glaber doesn't make that throw. He's so I clearly a self confident player. Yes, and he's got the athleticism and the tools to to the point of what they're hoping for. Another thing is he also control for the next couple of years for them. So they do have a future outlook here. If, you know, Glaber Torres doesn't work out at second base from the future. It's like, you know, we could slot him back. Well, I think we know Glaber court. Torres isn't going to work out. For them we'll get to it. We'll get to Glaber and his comments in a little bit, Joel. So uh, to the other, other side of the Jazz Chisholm trade, what they gave up in, in the prospects and uh, uh, Ramirez, the catcher, you know, what did you make of that? Did you think that this was an overpay? This was a fair uh, trade concerning what you saw the rest of the market and how it developed? Yeah, so I think the Yankees had a conundrum besides the not great stuff to get it at the deadline uh, was even if they wanted to try to get into better stuff. Uh, from what I understood, they told teams Jason Dominguez was off the table. That was not a player they wanted to discuss. And they'd only discuss Spencer Jones and George Lombard in, in real difference-making trades, and they clearly didn't get there. Well, even Dominguez and Lombard, they're fine prospects, but they're not top 25, top 30 in the sport prospects. The Yankees have traded a ton of prospects, especially over the last year, four years, particularly pitching. So there was less of it. Uh, they have they suffered a lot of injuries in their minor leagues this year. Everson Pereira was out for the year. Chase Hampton, I think, literally came back from another injury today as we're talking. Some of their lower guys, Henry LaLanne, et cetera, were hurt a lot this year. And then they just had guys kind of fall off the rails a little bit, including the guy who's starting tonight for them in Philadelphia, Will Warren, who was battling for a rotation spot with Luis Heel in spring training and then ended up with like a six ERA at AAA. And now people have told me he had pitched better recently, but so their farm system was not in great shape. And therefore, uh, the scouts I talked to told me th three of the names who came up as good secondary prospects got traded. Uh, uh, Augustin Ramirez, Cerna, and uh, the guy who went today for lighter cows. Uh, 
I think that those are the kind of guys you have to trade to do anything. The one that comes up the most when I talk to people is there. there's this feeling that there's upside in Ramirez's bat. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see. Historically, Brian Cashman has been very, very good at trading prospects with very little pain long term uh, uh, showing up on the other side of it. So, uh, you know, we'll, I, this is going to take years to know for sure. But they traded the kind of prospects they had a trade to even do supplementary things. And uh, they held on to the guys that they thought were the best of their group. And I, I will add one other thing is you mentioned Chisholm has control. So does Leiter and De Los Santos have control beyond this year. And in the bullpen where Clay Holmes is a free agent, Loisica, Lo- 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 who's missing the whole year, is a free agent. Tommy Canely is a free agent. Uh, they probably need to have more guys they think could be part of, if not a closer conversation than at least a strong setup conversation. So I'm curious how Leiter and De Los Santos do if they become not just guys who help this year, but help moving forward. Well, that's where I wanted to go to next was with both for Leiter and De Los Santos is how do you see these two guys slotting into this bullpen as currently constructed? You know, we also saw the news that the Yankees traded with the Astros, which is something we've discussed here as well, that they don't do that very well, uh, do that very much, but Ferguson gets shipped off to the Astros, so you now lose another lefty. And correct me if I'm wrong, Joel, Tim Hill's the only left-handed bullpen pitcher they have now at this point. They didn't get Tanner Scott, right, like a big left-handed guy on the market. They didn't pay that astronomical price that the the Padres uh, paid for him. So where do you see ultimately Leiter and De Los Santos slouting into the bullpen here for the Yankees? Well, they did sign Brett Phillips, the former outfielder, a left-hander who's been throwing 97 in the independent league. So we'll see how fast and far he could come. Uh, Yeah, you know, Tim Hill's the guy. Doesn't feel like there's an obvious guy sitting down in double or triple A who they could get at this point. Trading season is officially over, so you're not getting them from outside. Uh, I think the key item, sorry to be redundant, Ryan, is the swing and miss. Uh, the Yankees have lost a bunch of games in extra innings. You know, you start with a runner at second. If you can't strike anyone out, hard to stop that runner from scoring. Uh, and we've just seen, you know, you put the ball in play enough, there'll be hits and mistakes, et cetera. So they needed to get it. I and, and I'll throw in one other name that I think becomes important. He, Ian Hamilton pitched really well for the Yankees last year. They can really use him to show up again. Does Lou Trevino show up again? Does Scott Efros show up again? Does Nick Birdie, who has some overpowering stuff, but has really spent 10 years never being healthy as a professional baseball player? So there's other options. By the way, they're all right-handed, as you mentioned. But I think it's going to be this kind of legion ball of relief pitchers where he, he feels like he has more places to go. And I think it will be interesting Because the one thing the Yankees have been excellent at over the last several years is the ability to take relief pitchers Mm -hmm. and find the best of them. Like Tim Hill has pitched much better for the Yankees than he was pitching for the White Sox. Jake Cousins has pitched pretty well. Michael Tonkin has pitched way better for the Yankees than he did for the Mets. Uh, Cousins has options. I assume he'll go down uh, to allow either De Los Santos uh, and, and Leiter up for one spot. I think the other spot will be interesting who they decide goes uh, in that scenario. Uh, But I think that Boone will be open to, especially lighter, uh, can he pitch the eighth inning? Yeah. You know, because I think in the best circumstances, they would try to like to use Luke Weaver as an attack dog for more than an inning. Like, hey, Stroman goes short. Can we just throw Weaver in the game in the third or fourth inning? keep the Yankees connected. And if they're connected, then go to a better group of late now late inning relievers. So I think especially lighter to me falls into the category of can he pitch the eighth inning? Yeah. That's ultimately where, where we're looking at here, right, Joel? Cause, because, you know, you've, you've kind of talked to me a little bit with Holmes and and that, you know, listen, there are worse closers out there in baseball. He's a guy that's going to pitch the contact. You got to play good defense behind him. You know that, you know what you're getting basically in, in Holmes and closing games. But we asked that, that situation of could the Yankees get a guy like Tanner Scott who can potentially close games for you in a pinch if Holmes continues to struggle or he goes in a slump or, you know, and have that versatility. 
So with a guy like Leiter, it seems like, you know, is he going to be that late inning guy that you can rely on maybe in a pinch? If let's say Holmes goes three out of four in a day, you know, at closing games that, Hey, maybe Leiter can close a game for us. I don't, I don't know. Like, how, do you envision that could be possibility with Leiter, or is he just mostly going to be like you said, maybe like that six, seven, maybe that eighth inning guy for you? I think it's probably all TBD, and I think probably Aaron Boone feels it will be TBD. Let's see how these guys handle New York, uh, which we know can be a different kind of beast. Uh, you know, does Mark Leiter have some advantage that both his dad and uncle play for the Yankees at some point? Uh, you know, maybe. Uh, I'll throw out one that I think about a lot. I don't think they could do it because I think he's a good starting pitcher. We'll see if he could do it to the end. When Clark Schmidt comes back, can Luis Heal be a guy they use at the end of games? Uh, in the way that like Adam Wainwright at the beginning of his career ended up at the end of games, closing for the or a championship Cardinal team, uh, by the way. I think it's an option if his innings need to be limited at the end. And or, you know, Schmidt comes back good. And where do the Yankees sign up for that, right? Like, Garrett Cole isn't starting tonight with whatever general achy body is. Are you concerned um, about that real quick? Because I wanted well, to ask you about that, too. I mean, if I were the Yankees, uh, first of all, are they full of shit? And they know there's more going on because, like, that was not an injury for the first 35 years of my career. And now I've heard both Aaron Judge and Garrett Cole have general body achiness. Maybe it's because I'm an old man. I have general fucking body achiness every day. Uh, I assume every baseball player after about a week of spring training has general body achiness. So to me, that's not a reason not to start a major league baseball game. Uh, they said he'll start over the weekend. Let's see. Are they full of shit? Or is he going to start over the weekend? Because, again, it will be hard to win a championship. You know, Garrett Cole hasn't shown up this season yet. He didn't play the first half. And the version the Yankees have gotten is a imitation of Garrett Cole, but not the dominant force that he was last year when he won the Cy Young. Going to be hard to get to the finish line the way they want to get to the finish line unless that guy shows up at some point. But, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, it, it, it's a fascinating development, right, on the most important day of the year if you're trying to put together your team for that postseason push, right? So, you, like you said, you've got the imitation of Garrett Cole – if the Yankees are full of shit, let's say they know something's actually going on with him because we know that he has been he had the elbow injury earlier this year he's dealt with. The 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 opportunity was there to get Jack Flaherty. He the, the return How good's Jack the, Flaherty. The I mean he's just, pitching well this year, is he not? The, the, the yeah, he was pitching well last year and then had a six ERA uh, down the stretch after he got traded. I wouldn't trust him in a big spot. And the Dodgers traded a, a bag of garbage for him, which probably should say something. By the way, the best Yankee prospect traded in the trade deadline was Trey Sweeney. Yeah, uh, that's you know? what I'm saying. So who is this? It's like it didn't. I would wonder uh, if over some time, uh, some stuff. Maybe it, it doesn't feel kosher. That he Jack Flaherty was traded for less than you say Kikuchi, right? And that that was a massive overpay. It feels like, but that wasn't so, a massive overpay. Dana Dana Brown's a good scout. Like those, whatever. Like everyone told me that the Astros massively overpaid for Justin Verlander last year. But like, if the Mets went out in the marketplace today with Drew Gilbert and Ryan Clifford, they would have gotten shit in return. You know, like it wasn't like there were teams clamoring for those two players. But Kikuchi was a, pitching to a seven ERA in his last couple starts and the Yankees lit him up the last time that he faced against them. So yeah, it's a team that you're, you're going to play probably in the playoffs and the Astros, you would think if you're going to make a run. That's why I'm saying to you, Yankee fan, and probably hopefully lots and lots of Yankee fans who are watching, that was this deadline. Nobody special got traded, including Jack Flaherty. Jack Flaherty shows up for game one of a playoff series. Yankees get to the World Series and Jack Flaherty starting a game. I wouldn't quake in my boots. Uh, there was not greatness traded. And the Yankees probably, let's say they even knew Cole was really hurt. Was that a reason then to lose all of their discipline? It's a, Look, this is a go for a year. You got to lose right, that's some, some of your discipline, right? You got to overpay. This is one of those years you got to overpay a little. But I wouldn't do it for Jack Flack. Oh, like massively, even in desperation, I wouldn't massively overpay. I'd, ma I'd ma massively overpay for Tarek Skubal. Mm -hmm. uh, I get uncomfortable for Garrett Crochet, especially whatever's going on there, if I knew he was pitching in the postseason. And look, I'm not a big fan of Blake Snell, but when Blake Snell's on, a very hard-to-hit guy, 
I don't know how he'd handle New York, et cetera. But, uh, you know, those are three different Bs from Jack Flaherty. I would not go crazy for Jack Flaherty. Right. That Jack, That's kind Jack of... Jack Flaherty falls into the uh, Lucas Giolito school of you would think it's better than it is. Understood the player, Jack Flaherty. I think the more... The, the point I'm trying to make is, is if you do know something more is going on with Garrett Cole, even though they said they're not going to put any more tests on But you can only him. acquire who's available, Ryan. Correct. Like, but so, that's like, to your point. You you know you lose your you lose your discipline because it is the go in all for it year. You know you only have Juan Soto guaranteed for another couple months. You only have Aaron Judge in his prime for how many years here, having a, a Lou Gehrig type of season. And so can I say something that I, it's, yeah it's really how I thought about it when this trade deadline was done. If the Yankees had a good trade deadline because their complementary players play well, they're still not doing anything if the group that has been here doesn't play well. Because and 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 by the way, I'm thinking again, I'm talking about every contender. Mm -hmm. Nobody added anything where they could be like, oh, this is what gets us over the line. Uh so I look at this group and I say, wow, Rodon and Hill has pitched better recently. Can they continue? Can Stroman and Cortez show up again? Can they ever find the best of Clay Holmes? Because he seems to disappear after about seven weeks of uh, th this season. Like, I, you know I've been on the Austin Well bandwagon well before everyone else got on it. I was like, And you've been absolutely game. spot on, Joel. I mean, I've he's been, been one I've of the been, best offensive catchers the last couple of months of, this, of the know, season. You know, like even before the numbers were there, I kept saying these at-bats are good at-bats, and if you keep taking good at-bats, good things will happen. He's playing a lot right now, a real lot. Will he be able, until Trevino comes back, I thought they might actually go out and get a catcher today to just survive a short period of time. If they're not going to play Carlos Narvaez, like right. somebody who they would trust to put behind there. Maybe Trevino will be back soon. But I guess my point is the Yankees put together a team they thought was a championship team. For 75-ish games this year, they were. They need, no matter what they did in the last 72 hours from Chisholm forward, nothing changes. If that championship cornerstone that existed before they made a single trade here doesn't show up, it's th that's what it's about to me. Like, like can more than judge and Soto show up, which means can Cole be healthy and et cetera. Well, I think you hit on a name there that I wanted to ask you about too, is Carlos Rodon and his last couple performances gone to seven innings in his last two starts. Is that someone, you know, that you may be convinced, Hey, this guy might've made those adjustments that you were alluding to that. Hey, can he make those adjustments? Are you seeing him perform better and pitch better or, Again, are we just going to be in that watch and see? Let's see how now the other teams adjust to whatever his adjustments were. Yeah, I mean, uh, watching Sunday Night Baseball, especially listening to David Cohn talk about the um, value of the widened repertoire where he's throwing his change up a lot and effectively to add into his slider and fastball. Does he have the consistency and craft and mentality to continue to do that. The one thing I would say has been excellent this year, and it's gotten lost a little because he had such a bad downturn, is Rodon hasn't always taken the ball over and over again. The one thing he's been, you know, for them, knock on wood, very healthy, and it's been important. They don't have a lot of margin for error starting pitching-wise, right? Uh when Schmidt went down, they got a couple of good starts from Poteet. Poteet went down. You know, you're starting to look around and say, you know, they had to bring Will Warren up today. Yep. What does that look like? And so uh, part of it is Rodon needs to continue to stay healthy. They, they, they've had <laughs> remarkable health from their rotation this season. By comparison, when you look around the league, the Orioles – who traded for two, to your point, you know, what's your need? Who traded for two starting pitchers, have had three starting pitchers, have Tommy John surgery. So, you know, it was uh, mandatory for Baltimore to, to do this. So I don't know the answer because we haven't seen Carlos Rodon have to do anything beyond rely on natural skill. And clearly he's got to do more. And in these last few starts, especially at the start again in Boston, that, that was really good. Like that, that mix up of pitches was really good. And so 
you know, if that continues, he's a game one or two starter. I mean, this guy almost won two Cy Young awards not very long ago. Yeah. So the starting rotation, you know, we've you've you've hit on the health, but the performance has not been great the last month. You know, they they have one of the worst pitching starting rotation staff ERAs in the last month as well. So the idea of starting pitching, and I t- I asked you about Flaherty. You go, hey, I'm not really high on Flaherty. Crochet was out there. Snell was out there. There, there's the opportunities there for you to make an improvement on the starting rotation and maybe push a guy like Luis Hill to your point into the was bullpen. There? I, 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 you're the insider. That's why I'm asking you. Yeah, so I don't point. think Snell became was really available. I think the Giants, because Robbie Ray came off the injured list and pitched so well, and Snell's pitched so well for the last four, their their executives are kind of on the tinderbox for their jobs. They've got a shot in a very kind of like, if you saw what Farhan Zaidi, their head of baseball operations, said after the end of the trade deadline, he said, we have the best rotation in the major leagues. I think they want to take a shot with that. So is it, and Snell has a very tricky contract because he has a player option. Right. And a player option is the death of trades because how, if, if he has a good year, he's going to opt out. But how do you trade for it? If he's bad or injured, you have $32 million booby trap on your on your ledger for next season. It's a very problematic thing to trade for when the player controls an option in out years. So they didn't trade him. By the way, they didn't trade Matt Chapman. So they were going for it. Crochet, who is like once Crochet puts down this edict, I'm not pitching in the postseason without a contract extension. I mean, the Dodgers were dying for him. The Dodgers were going to really push hard, but that becomes more problematic if if he's going to suddenly say, I'm not pitching. So I think he gets off the chessboard, and I don't think the Tigers were trading Tarek Skubal. And lots of teams needed starting pitching, Ryan. All of them didn't get those three guys. And if you tell me the fourth guy is Jack Flaherty, that's a big dip in that. To me, I would take Eflin before I took Flaherty. Okay, I got you there. So, for your, for you, and what I'm, I'm just trying to read a little bit into what you're saying about this way that the Yankees approach this deadline, and maybe it was more reflective on how this deadline turned out to be for most of baseball. There wasn't that big move to be made for you, and to to make that huge impact move for the Yankees, there was nothing presented there. In real, if you're realistically looking at it, and when I'm going to hear Brian Cashman talk tomorrow about it, how he's assessed. Why is he talking Yankees. tomorrow? He used to talk right after the deadline. Well, they're playing the right Yankees now. So fucked up with their fans now. They were like this with the draft, where they didn't talk during the draft, like 29 other teams did. Again, I'm on the list serve here. I'm watching all the GMs talk. What's going on there? What's going on there? Are they, is, is this arrogance? Is it cowardice? Is it some combination? Because Brian Cashman used to be incredibly media friendly and, uh, you know, would talk at the end of the trade deadline, which, by the way, I know it's tough in New York. You know who talked at the end of the trade deadline? David Stern's talk. I know. Right? Anyway, just just a thought there. Uh, that's again. I I said it to Tommy when when I saw it on on social media. Hey, Brian Cashman speaking tomorrow to reporters. I'm like, okay, that's a little right. interesting considering they're playing Why not right talk, now. Uh, delay it till September first. It will be as relevant. Go ahead. But that that's ultimately where I'm leading to you with this question is is uh, when you're grading this trade deadline, you might not have a grade for it because you might want to wait. And I know Joel, you like to watch it to, before you even see what happens because you don't like looking in the crystal ball that much. But because I think gonna, that that crystal ball's fucked up. I think that that ruins life. Like, I know everyone's got to be an expert and you got to be black and white, but we don't know shit yet. We don't know shit about shit. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But considering what you saw, everyone's going to deadline- give a grade. I'd like to go look at everyone's grades for the last five years. I bet you none of them are good. So, are you saying that this Yankees trade deadline was not good? No, no. What I'm saying is the grades were good. Saying. This Yankee deadline was like everybody's Yankee deadline. T- TBD, because everybody who was in this acquired supplementary players. I think this is going to be still about the core groups of teams and how you did supplementarily. Like, and by the way, some of the supplemental p- players will probably play like stars, and that will really have a lot of matter. Who would know who those are going to be? Okay. I, with, within the realm of what was possible, 
Mm -hmm. The Yankees did fine. They did par. I think that's the term I use. They needed to get a couple of relievers who can miss bats and at least one more offensive player. Would it have been better if they got two offensive players? Sure. Name me the guy. I Andy think they Diaz. would have been like Mark Can Canna got traded in this market. I actually think he would have been a good compliment for Verdugo. But to do that, to do that, are you ready to cut DJ LeMayu? Because you can only have 13 position players. One of the one of the backups, you can have four backups. One of them has to be a catcher. We're down to three. One of the other guys has to be able to play shortstop. So as Waldo Cabrera, we're down to two. Like at some point, they're going to have to make a tough DJ LeMayu decision. And an Anthony Rizzo yeah. discussion too as well. Yes. when But but Rizzo might come back after September 1st when you could go to 28th. So you could have, a, the you know, the 14th position player. And there'll be five more injuries by then. But in the, <laughs> in, in, in the short term here, you know, there's a tough LeMayu discussion uh, about what you're going to do. But – Get back to it. Like having Mark Hanna or not shouldn't decide if you're going to win the AL East or a World Series. I just, I use the term all the time. There's not the better back store. Like good bats, you know, Paredes and Chisholm, who are fine, were the best position players traded. Eflin and Flaherty are kind of the best starters traded. It's fine. Tanner Scott and I don't know were the best relievers traded. You praised Tan Tanner Scott though. You said Tanner Scott was he. This is a guy who can actually be a really good impact left-handed uh, bullpen he, pitcher for you. And and I, but, but I wonder. And again, we maybe this will be something Brian Cashman will talk about tomorrow. I doubt is it would be fascinating to know if everyone on Truth Serum if they could only have Mark Leiter or Tanner Scott who they would have taken. I bet you they would have taken Mark Leiter. Because his baseball savant page lights up? Is that why? Well, I mean, Tanner Scott's baseball savant page lights up. I think that there's a real, and I have it also, I I have a real fear of walks. Uh, now, Tanner Scott, when he's been good the last two years, the walks have been down. They were up at the beginning of the season, but they're down again. When he's locked down, I mean, the two games he closed against the Mets recently, that, that was great. You know, and when he's that, he's that, you know, Padres, there was some significant stuff moved, perhaps, if you believe in Snelling, uh, to, to get it done. A.J. Prella does, is a, and I admire the hell out of it, by the way, is a don't care about tomorrow executive. It could be because. He's been told there is no tomorrow. You better that's make what, the So year. that's ultimately where the, the big discussion here is, right? Like, so for Brian Cashman, this is it. This is the year you have the two best hitters in baseball. This is the By year the way, San Diego traded Soto just before you finished that sentence. <laughs> right. Go ahead. And so, but, but to your point, again, Joel, you're getting an unreal year from Judge, an unreal year from Soto. You hopefully get Garrett Cole in, into his prime performance here. So, uh, this is your chance it, Ryan, to go. What would, you, what would you have done? To, to, to go get a, a, a Tanner Scott, if it tell if you're telling me if I'm going all in this year, and if you're Brian Cashman, that you haven't been to the World Series since 2009, go trade Spencer Jones because from what I understand, they're going to be all in on Juan Soto in the offseason. So does it really fucking matter if the guy's on the roster at the end of the year? I, I need a left-handed. Well, really mind matters, you, you're going to go against the Orioles team that has a load of left-handed hitters that are good hitters. So yeah. you're telling me Tommy Canley is going to get all these left-handed hitters out in the, in the eighth inning? When you're up by two runs, like that's yeah. that's what but we're looking at right now. When you lose your discipline completely, is when you have problems. You know, Tanner Scott. I, I I encourage you to go do this at the end. And by the way, Tanner Scott, maybe he'll pitch great. He'll pitch great. He'll close out the World Series. You know, I think I told this story on the show an, an early, like a couple of months ago, where I was. You asked me to tell a trade deadline story, and it was like oh four. I think it was no no oh eight because the Red Sox win the World Series. They trade for Eric Gagne. They beat the Yankees. Those were the two finalists. And Gagne had been really good up to the deadline. And um, uh, I told an official from the Yankees, well, you fucked up. You lost uh, whatever. Gagne almost single-handedly sunk the Red Sox. Like, he was terrible. Uh, because sometimes that's how it works. It's, uh, you know, keep an eye on. The Brewers acquired Nick Mears yesterday uh two days ago nick mears who the fuck is nick mears nick mears is a guy who the brewers who seem to be a very smart organization 
thought was pitching for a very bad organization. And Nick Mears, just one game, first game, he went one, two, three with two strikeouts. He had like a 570 ERA, kind of like Clay Holmes when the Yankees got him. I the bullpen guys are it's uh the best in season relief trade Brian Cashman has probably ever made was for Kerry Wood, who had over a six ERA when the Yankees acquired him and under a one ERA in about 25 outings for the Yankees and help them get to the playoffs. Bullpen is fungible and flammable and guessing who's going to p- pitch well for 20 innings and to give up your best prospect for it. I'm not saying you don't do it. I'm not saying you don't do it, but man, it's a tough thing to do. It's a but, very tough thing to do because it's only 20 innings. He's a free agent at the end of the year. And Tana Scott has essentially played on the worst teams in the major leagues since he arrived with the 100-plus loss Orioles uh, and then the terrible Marlin teams, except for the playoff team last year, which was an 84-win team. He doesn't play before big crowds. He could get very, very wild. He might be great. But you're talking about, like, how, how about this? Is I don't think Tanner Scott will be the difference between a team winning a championship or not. Okay. That's all I wanted to hear. That's and, But, but, like, but- like, 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 you have to live in the world of what's possible, Ryan. Okay. And like, there are a lot of teams, including ones we would think are incredibly well run, who didn't trade for Tana Scott today. Right? Like, we could make the case who's closing for the Dodgers, who we think are, are incredibly well run? Craig Kimbrell, who we know sucks in a big spot. The Orioles didn't trade for Tana Scott. Right, they got two guys who the Phillies didn't even want on their roster anymore. Right, so it'll so, give what three home and runs, by, by three the way, runs yesterday. The Orioles under Mike Elias are incredibly well run. They probably see some stuff they think they could clean up with him, those two guys, and Trevor Rogers. But the if you're an Oriole fan today, you're sitting and going, "Wait, we're having this year from Gunnar Henderson. We have this kind of group of talent." And I know things will be good for the next few years, but nobody really knows about any of the other years. I mean, even this year, the Orioles haven't gone as well as we thought it was going to go for them. Nobody promises you tomorrow. And this is all we did at the deadline with all of our reserve of farm talent, which is so much more than the Yankees. Correct. This is what we did. So I think that that could be the attitude of, if you think there's 15 contenders of 15 contender webcasts or fan bases today, because it was that deadline. Those are the kind of players who were traded. Yeah. I, I think Joel, there's just a lot of Yankees fans are obviously excited about this team and, and the championship aspe- aspirations that they have. Right. But it's the thing with Brian Cashman, the prospect hugging that you hear attached to his name. And it's wondering, and you're telling me in reality, there just wasn't that move out there, Ryan. There but, wasn't that that situation where they could go all in on that player that was going to be a huge impact bat or a huge impact relief pitcher for them. And that's the reality of the situation is what you're telling me. But we as fans go, I don't care about Spencer Jones because he's not going to help us win this year. If I can deal him and it's going to help me. But you might have said that in like 2015 about Aaron Judge. I don't care about Aaron Judge. I need to win this year. We haven't won since 2009. Who the fuck is Aaron Judge? He's like, what is he doing at Double A? 2009 was six years of a championship. We're now dealing at 15 years now. So it's not, you know, what I'm saying like it's another nine years. I'm sure you were very calm when it was only six years. <laughs> I mean, I hated Jacoby Ellsbury. So that's besides yeah. the point when I hated in 2015. Uh, Joel, speaking of relief pitching in the relief market, I figure we should definitely bring in our PA, Tommy Hogan, who's actually the producer now. Give him credit. The kid deserves it. He got it there. But Let's bring in Tommy for Hogue Analytics, and he's going to talk about the relief pitchers the Yankees required at this deadline. What up, Tommy? What up, guys? Before I get started, Joel, got to tip my cap. You were right. The Yankees and Astros were going to make a trade with each other at the deadline. You <laughs> nailed that one. I uh, didn't. But if Caleb Ferguson gets Juan Soto out in a big spot in the playoffs, that'll that'll hurt quite a bit. But we'll, we'll move on to what the Yankees did. Are you we're... really playing a Caleb Ferguson, Juan Soto? You know how – how insane what you just said was. 
he, he, Caleb he, Ferguson he, was terrible for the Yankees. Horrible. Really, okay. That's what would make it hurt even more. All right. Okay. Go ahead, Tommy. So the bolt, the relievers. That it's they been a long day for me, Tommy. Let's I get it. Along. I get it. I get it. <laughs> The Yankees, the relievers that they acquired today, I think a lot of fans, I know you don't want to give a grade, but I think a lot of fans watching here would give the Yankees pretty much an F on what they did today. I'm going to try to give a reason why they should be a little bit more excited about what they did. They acquired, you F mentioned. on the two relievers they got? On what they did today as a whole. So, yeah, pretty much. I mean, they. Uh, so the Yankees, the, you mentioned the, the strikeout rate, Joel. They, they acquired two of the top three in their bullpen now in strikeout rate in Leiter and De Los Santos. They're 11th and 42nd in all of baseball in strikeout rate. Going to Leiter, he has 50 set, 53 strikeouts this, this season, 39 of them him come off the splitter. That splitter has a .053 batting average against. That minimum 50 plate appearances of a pitch used, it has the lowest batting average against of any pitch in all of baseball. Minimum 50, 50 plate appearances. One of the elite pitches in all of baseball, Mark Leiter has. And one of the – on Baseball Savant, they compare uh, – they use five players to compare to what he's doing this season. 2023, Keenan Middleton is one of them, who the Yankees acquired last off, or last trade deadline. thought that was kind of interesting. Eniel De Los Santos, he's 12th among all qualified relievers and left on base percentage. And the Yankees, who don't give their guys clean innings, that's a big deal for them. They want a guy that can go in and leave some inherited runners on base. So the fact that he's 12th in all of baseball, and that would be number one in the Yankees' bullpen, that could be something that they saw and said, okay, that could be useful in our, in our pen. Now, a little bit of a silly one here. He forces one out of every five of his fly balls as infield pop-outs. That, those are easy outs. If, if you're coming in and getting inherited runners, that's something that doesn't move the runner over. That's another thing that they could like. However – one out of every uh, five of his fly balls is also a home run, and he leads all qualified relievers in home runs per nine. However, he's only given up two in the last twelve appearances. If you're how, are, how what have you done for me lately, kind of guy? Two in the last twelve appearances isn't very good, by the way. What? That's not bad. That's uh, that's better than what he's done for the last. He gave up a le- so he gave <laughs> up nine of his. You're home okay runs with eleven home runs giving up that. a home run every six appearances? Yeah, every six innings. Yeah. That's one and a half. That's one and a half per nine innings. Or ten for sixty innings. But it, it's better than it's better than what his season was. So in the last twelve appearances, it those numbers are going season, down. Right, but like all right. by one home run per nine innings. Okay. I, I, I all this is gonna be T B D to me. And uh any fan who's saying it's an app is what 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 can I say? Like we don't know. I agree like, with you. Like, I, it would be great if, like, they could conjure Bob Gibson in his prime. That would have been a good guy to get today. Everything is I by agree with you. Everything's by comparison. I, I just – tell me tell me who didn't get an F today if the Yankees got an F. The Yankees had the same exact trade deadline as everybody else. Or a little better or a little worse. But everybody got secondary players who was in this. Who had a better trade deadline? The Yankees – or the Orioles, or by the way, the Red Sox, who in theory are in this. How about if you're the Red Sox and 37,000 people show up a game and you suddenly find yourself in a race and they say to you, uh, yeah, we got Lucas Sims and Luis Garcia, who, by the way, might be great because, again, they're relief pitchers and we don't know. But anyway. All right, finally, Joel, I want to wrap up and I want to ask you a question. I mean, the day the Yankees got Ian Hamilton, was everybody thrilled? The day they got Clay Holmes, was everybody thrilled? You know, it's like all the moron shit I see on social media, like, oh, the team got this guy. And it's like, oh, print the World Series. Uh, everybody gets players like, like, you got to fill out a 40-man roster. In spring training, you need 80 guys to show up. So I will always wonder, are people pr- purposefully stupid or do they just, like, are actually stupid? Oh, come on, Joel. <laughs> Let's not be that mean. I think... I think this is my lane. fans are passionate. We are fanatics for a reason, right? So that that is right, how we like, react to things like but, that. But we have to deal within, like, I have chicken or fish. If you just keep insisting on steak, unless I could kill a cow in front of you, what am I going to do? This is what was available in the marketplace. I don't want to defend. I think 
you know that I don't like the players. I know. I didn't like the players in the offseason. I am not thrilled with this. But, like, you also have to be realistic about what is available. And that fans constantly want to trade players who they've never seen lift their arm or swing. You know who they should trade? This prospect. Have you ever seen him? If he walked by you, would you know who the fuck he is? But you I think, think we do. I think we do now more than than twenty you years don't. ago. What? You don't. Okay. You, know, you read Baseball America. You don't. We watch don't. videos. We watch all the hype. Right. We watch breakdowns. We watch all watch those things. Breakdowns. Great. Nobody knew Aaron Judge was good. Nobody was talking about Ben Rice in spring training. Like, come on. We don't have some humility okay. about it. I do this twenty four hours a day. I have no idea. None. Okay. Zero. I have the best I have is a couple of talent evaluators who I really respect and they're wrong more than they're right. And those who are good have humility about it. The best, the best executives will always tell you, I still know less than I need to know. And there's so much more to know, but every fan knows the prospects that should be traded and the players who will be good because we've been taught by social media and stupid talk radio to have fucking instant opinion on everything. Joel is setting the world ablaze right now. All right, so last thing I wanted to ask you about was the Nestor Cortez thing that you had, had tweeted about in the last couple of days. So that situation was very interesting to me, and I, I wanted to know if there was something more to that. I mean, we saw Tommy Emmett, obviously, in a three-team deal, get traded to the Dodgers. You know, the Yankees, you had teased about this, did make this move with Harrison Bader and Jordan Montgomery a couple of years ago, and it seemed like a similar situation was developing with the Nestor Cortez. So – are you telling me that this was just a right opportunity for the Yankees that they were looking at? Like, Hey, we, we like the guy Edmund as a gold Glover shortstop defensive utility guy. And Nestor Cortez, you know, a guy who's been struggling of recently late, um, you know, we can, we can trade him and get some value back in return or how should we read a Nestor Cortez situation here? I think that the Yankees probably like every good organization had, plans A to Z uh, with all different permutations. And I think there was probably one where Cortez was used either directly, and I do think the Cardinals had interesting. So the way I understand it was that three-team trade uh, that went down between the White so- among the White Sox, Dodgers, and Cardinals was in play for about 72 hours, and the Yankees were very aware of it. And it was understood that the Cardinals' first choice in a starting pitcher was Eric Fetty. And if that could be configured in the right way, they would take Fetty. If it fell apart, I think Nestor Cortez became a possibility. But the Yankees didn't go far down that road because to go far down that road meant they would have had to find in this market a starting pitcher they liked at least as much as Cortez or 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 better. Uh, and I'm not sure that they got there. Uh, I didn't sense they got there to okay. that point because, you know, time is precious because there is a deadline and you just don't want to go down roads on possibilities. And I think they were, they were led to strongly believe that if Fetty could get to the Cardinals, it would be done in that way. Now, did they like the Dodgers try to get into it and create three team? I'm sure they did. You know, this is a veteran front office. I'm sure they went through all the a bunch of permutations trying to figure out if there was a way to 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 do something. But um, I do think it says that. Look, I think that they were probably willing to talk about Ben Rice. I think mm-hmm. they were probably willing to talk about Cortez. I think they were probably willing to talk about Torres, Grisham, like under the right circumstances because their farm system, as I mentioned, was in a place that was not as good as previously, they might have had to like figure out how to use something. The word I kept hearing is, could they get creative? Yeah. And I think even Yankee people were talking about, can we get creative? And it's tough. It's a, look, it's, it's tough even within an organization to get your group to believe like this is a good trade or this is a good player and stuff. Like, look, we have differences of opinion on players and how things should be done and organizations like that. So do you have alignment there? Then you got to get another team to kind of see the worry of the world like you do. Now you have to get a third team to see it the way 
they see it. So, uh, you know, very difficult. Uh, any trade is difficult because of that, because it starts with getting alignment in your own organization to do something. Uh, but I think they were in play in a lot of different areas, but it was a difficult fishbowl because there was not greatness in the fishbowl. And you have to keep coming back and asking yourself, we could trade Nestor Cortez. Will we do better than Nestor Cortez? Like, I think Tarek Skubal didn't get traded because the Tigers stared into the abyss. And as much as they need positional help, and they need positional help, they kept thinking to themselves, the second we trade Tarek Skubal, you know what we need? Tarek Skubal. We don't have him anymore, and it's hard to find. And unless we know he's a time bomb because we know his injury history or something about him or he's a bad guy, it's a hard trade to make. And so I think that team, once it did what it did, kind of like has to commit this offseason. A.J. Hinch knows Alex Bregman well. Does Alex Bregman become the third baseman of the Tigers as a free agent? Do they find – you? because know, they've got to go find position players and they need to start winning in 2025, you know, like like they yeah. thought this year was going to be a little better. But I I can't – It's I'm sorry for the redundancy. No, you're all good. This, this was a tight fishbowl. This was not, you know, we're going to look back and we're going to be like, yeah, like, like, forget about grading any team. If we were grading this trade deadline where we talked about Vlad Guerrero Jr. Uh, and uh, uh, Tarek Google, and Snell. Like, yeah, all those guys. Stuff, like, and what it was, I mean, this was a dud or close to it because it was all supporting actors. We didn't have we didn't give out an Oscar for a yeah. best actor at this one. And so I think which organizations did the best in the secondary group. And there will be ones that pop. And it will be fascinating to see, see what it was. Uh, you know, the Dodgers traded for an there were four players on the injured list who were acquired in this deadline. Four. That's interesting. I and mean, when the Yankees did that a couple of years ago with Harrison Bader, I mean there were Yankee fans running around like knifing themselves. Right. Like now this deadline, there were four of those guys uh, traded at the deadline as people are willing to wait a little bit for something they want. You know why? Because there wasn't good stuff in the day. In the Is this just a product, Joel, for you with the expanded what playoff and the third wildcard team, considering there's just more teams that are right there in contention? I think it's yes. Uh, I also think that when you have a lot of organizations that have group think, it's hard to make trades with each other because everybody thinks exactly the same. And so unless you have a perfect alignment, it doesn't work, which is why guys like AJ Prella and Dave Dombrowski and Alex Anthopoulos stand out is their willingness to go be bold and first is very different. And even those guys, right, they were bold. You know, is Jorge Soler somebody who moves the needle? Anthopoulos was pretty bold, had to take on a contract in 25 and 26 to be bold. We'll see, was that a good move? AJ Prello was definitely bold. He's essentially left an empty farm system for who's ever the executive moving forward. They might not even get in the playoffs, right? Like that's the situation uh, they're in. And the Phillies, you know, like Dave Dombrowski is a, um, like, He's one of those guys who goes and gets what he needs. They needed a guy to hit against lefty pitching. They got Austin Hayes. They needed bullpen. They got two bullpen guys. That's kind of where they are. But those guys are very different in the industry. And I think the combination of how like-minded so many guys are in the extra wild cards uh, changes everything. Okay. Yeah. And lastly, last question for me. The Glaber Torres situation. Okay, so it's been interesting. You know, I, I liked what you said about him. Like when you said a, after he's benched, right? He's been hitting well, and and I think we both know, like he is a very like mentally there. He has to be locked in 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 order to be a great, like a really good player, right? Or an, even just above average baseball player. But there are these lapses that happen in the field, and then you hear the comment after Jazz Chisholm was traded to the Yankees, and you know what the situation could possibly play out for you, Glaber. This is your contract walk year. Would you be open to playing third base? And the media, you guys are being responsible and asking him that. He goes, I'm a second baseman. I play second base. That just rubs Yankees fans the wrong way, Joel, and that you're just not open and willing to be like, 
I'm all in for the championship. We want to win. I'll do whatever the hell this team needs me to do to win. Meanwhile, a guy like Jazz Chisholm, who was questioned about his character, right, leading up into this trade deadline, the Yankees went out and got him. And you know what he keeps saying? And I, I know you could be like, Ryan, that don't mean fucking shit. He's playing up for the media. But he says, you know what? I'll do whatever the hell the team needs me to do to help win, to help win a championship. And this is his first time actually playing with a team that is all in on winning a championship. Yeah. I thought the fans thought they weren't all in. Anyway, um, the uh, the Glaber thing. Wasn't there a time where he probably said, I'm a shortstop? I'm playing shortstop? So anyway, uh, also, uh, I do want to talk about it. So let me talk about it. Is the Yankees are still bad at playing baseball. I I wish I had it in front of me. I was writing down plays in the Friday and Saturday games that were offensive to watch. And the guys who do offensive over and over and over again are Glaber Torres, Trent Grisham, and Alex Verdugo. Those guys do stuff that are is not good baseball. And so when the Yankees are hitting great and pitching great, it doesn't matter. But one of the reasons, and I think they're analytic guys who I assume don't even watch the fucking games, uh, don't is that they get beat in the postseason because the other team is better at baseball. Like, Jose Altuve is a great baseball player besides the numbers. He's a great baseball player. You just see it. Hey, we need a bunt. A bunt. We need to get the ball out of the stadium. I'll do that. We need to steal a base. I can do that. Like, but feel for the game. Alex Bregman, feel for the game. Uh, I don't have them all in front of me. I was writing them down as they were happening. There's a, there's a base hit. Trent Grisham is on second base. And Oswaldo Cabrera darts a base hit to right field. If you told me I had to describe how Trent Grisham went from second to third base, and I either could describe it as running or crawling, I would describe it as crawling. Now, in my mind, act like Trent Grisham is in right field and might lollygag it or boot it and make a hard turn because right field's a bitch in Fenway, especially. By the way, you should do it all the time. But in right field, if the ball moves anywhere, maybe you'll score. Your teams, by the way, the Friday night, they're in the shit still, right? Before they win a couple of games. Is that going to get your attention, Trent? No. Alex Verdugo hits a ground ball, I think, to uh, Raffaello, who makes a bad throw to first base. He almost collides with Verdugo. Verdugo keeps running down the first base line. He never looks over his shoulder to see where the ball went. By the way, 90 feet might help. Get to second base. Your team is in the fucking shitter. Can you do that? Trent Grisham in center field when they're blowing up Clay Holmes. Another lollygag to the ball to allow a guy to hustle into a double, right? Glaber Torres, the worst secondary leads you can imagine. Now, this falls under Aaron Boone, too, and a coaching staff, which is great. I know you're teaching them to throw harder, spin it more, swing from your ass, whatever. But teams that are better at playing baseball eliminate the Yankees from the playoffs all the time. Glaber Torres is part of the issue of not playing baseball well. Of not playing baseball well. There were five times in those two games, I wrote things down, and I just said, how, how is this acceptable? By the way, to Brian Cashman, to Hal Steinbrenner, to Aaron Judge, to Garrett Cole, like whoever you think of as the leadership fabric of the team. Don't, Aaron Boone uses a term all the time. We're buttoned up. No, you're not. No, you're not. That is not buttoned up. And I think I've said it on this show a lot. I think when you're in charge of something, you can do two things. If you could either fix it, but if you ain't fixing it, you're condoning it. There's no middle ground. You're in charge of something. Right. If I were the producer of a podcast or a webcast and I thought something wasn't working, I could either fix it or I'm condoning it. That's it when you're in charge. And I watch stuff that the Yankees do all the time. It came up yesterday where there was a play in the game against the Phillies. And David Cohen points out like Ben Rice isn't stretching to where the throw is coming from. That feels like T-ball to me. Like, what are we doing? Is that going to get corrected? Is that going to be two hours before first pitch? We need to be on the field or four hours before first pitch? Like, Ben Rice is new to the position. Mm -hmm. but, or, 
because you're either fixing it or condoning it. But that feels rude. Like the Yankees are messing up baseball 101 a lot. And a lot of it is just hustle. A lot of it is attention to detail and pre-thinking what you're going to do on a play. Uh, the Red Sox have beaten them a lot this year because they simply played harder than them. And the Yankees can get into the, when we throw it harder and hit it further, we win. Got it. Got it. That is casino baseball. Got it. You want to win a championship. You want to win a championship. Then some of that stuff has got to be cleaned up. And Kleber Torres is, is like, and I'm not just talking about the botch a ball, because clearly what's ever going on, he's botched a ball. But the bat, on that ball that's like the looper against the Red Sox, bad first step, bad hustle to the ball. Like, what's going on, man? Like, we're playing. This is championship and bust. You're in your walk year. What do I have to do to get your attention? Do I need to pull you off the field? Do I need to embarrass you to reporters? But uh, I think that they're going to lose games that are important because of stuff that is not cleaned up. And I think it will be very hard at that moment because it's been overt. You don't have to be a, a PhD in baseball to see some of this. And that it's not getting cleaned up. Uh, Alex Verdugo, by the way, leads off the game the other day and gets a single on a ball that hits the wall. Single. Your team has lost like 20 out of 25. By the way, it wouldn't matter if you won 20 out of 25. Like, first of all, you're not Aaron Judge. You don't know off the bat that it's going out. Can you run? My first basketball coach said something that was incredibly valuable. I think about as I watch pro sports now. Complete the play. Always complete the play. The referee will whistle and tell you when a play is over. If you don't hear it, complete the play. Don't assume anything. I watch that kind of stuff, and I'm like, these are major leaguers playing for the most important franchise in the sport. Can you complete the play? I'm fine. When the ball's out of the park, you want to take 30 seconds to run around the bases? Great. You want to throw the bat? Great. I don't care because the play is complete once it's out of the stadium. But until the play is complete, you got to do it right. And Glaber Torres is the captain of the team that has too much, many guys and too often that don't complete the play. It's going to be interesting to see how he plays down the stretch. And to your point, when the games are critical in the playoffs, how he makes those plays. And will By the way, I think Verdugo did it on his second at bat also and had a race in to get a double. Right? Yes. Am I right about that? I believe so. In that I game, believe so. Like, in other words, like, fool me once, ah, I could do it again. And he had a hustle in to, to get a double. I, I, yeah, I mean, I mean winning winning is the ultimate deodorant for these guys when they're, when they're doing those type of things, right? And that's, you know, we're talking about a, a ninth inning double from Trent Grisham that helped them win that Saturday game. Otherwise, they lose that series again against the Red Sox. And then we're really talking about what the F is going on with this team. We're going to see. Uh, as we're speaking and doing this, Joel, Jazz Chisholm hit another home run. So interesting, three home runs already for the kids, starting with the Yankees. I cannot thank you enough for talking about Yankees trade deadline with us, uh, as always. This was a lot of information, and I appreciate you breaking it all down for us. I know there's a lot coming. You have the show tomorrow. Brian Cashman speaking tomorrow. Let's see what the hell goes on with Garrett Cole. Let's see if the Yankees can start getting some of these pitchers back that you mentioned, and Efros and Trevino and – and we'll see how it goes down the stretch. And I'm looking forward to talking all this the rest of the season with you, man. I am interested also as if at some point Jason Dominguez comes up and plays a little bit. They really seem to like him. Uh, the manager really likes him. I think it's an interesting question. You know, if, if Verdugo goes into a dive again, what do they do? And maybe even if Verdugo doesn't go into a dive and they feel like... But when I talk to people who cover their minor leagues, they tell me that like Dominguez doesn't run out the balls in the minor leagues either. So we'll see how it goes because the Yankees apparently enforce no code 
from top to bottom. Just swing hard and throw it and spin it harder. Got to have a code if you want to win. Got to have a code if you want to win.